sure is how that happened a few years ago. And um, we've been running for four years. And we, um, I guess we're, we're set up um, to respond to this question, which is how many young people look around them and feel they've had a say in what they see. And I guess we could argue that that's a, a question which might be applicable to a lot of adults. Um, but it's, to, it's a question related to um, how young people feel um, about their relationship to um, the built environment. And we hope to answer that by empowering young people to shape um, the spaces in which they live, work and play. Um, the initiative was uh, set up four years ago um, based on, uh, I guess, a series of previous experiences. Um, it's worth just saying, Fiona and I are both trained as architects. Um, I run an architectural practice. I teach at UCL, University College London, and Fiona's been involved in education principally um, since, since graduating uh, in a number of roles, and we'll, we'll touch on those in a minute. But I guess it's, we've been working together um, for about 10 years prior to, um, prior to our time uh, setting up Matt and Fiona. And our, I guess our previous experiences, of a few of which are shown here, uh, the, 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 the active work in teaching and model making, um, the way in which our processes in teaching, which have always been about exploring through life-size models, um, experiential-based, I guess, architecture, particularly in first-year teaching when young, we are working with young people who um, fundamentally haven't experienced architecture in any kind of educated way before. So these are illustrations and slides of that. And I guess sort of personal experiences way back when for, of a desire to kind of make and do and within my own architectural practice, a kind of predisposition for sort of exploring and testing ideas through making. This was a, uh, a project called a Shelter, which we did over a series of years, working cross-platform with engineers and architects, exploring things. And I guess Fee and I first came together in Fiona's role at, um, at Open City, where she helped set up the education uh, arm there um, about uh, 12, 13 years ago. And this was a project which we took over a shopping centre um, and this is B taking over City Hall, um, but really giving young people an opportunity to express themselves often spatially with, with models. Um, and then about uh, six, seven years ago, we both had two sort of fairly catalytic experiences that, that um, one, was, one was in um, North America, mine was with an organization called Beam, um, uh, where really exciting organization that shares a sort of a lot of similarities to uh, philosophy to, to our approach, but where they invite a creatives um, to imagine a project which they couldn't build on their own um, and that they could they could collaborate with a group of 80 um, uh, 8 to 16 year olds to imagine sometimes it's filmmakers sometimes it's architects sometimes it's artists and I, I had this idea of this sort of dream machine boat that was based on a story by Gabriel Garcia Marquez but it's it puts kids in the in the driving seat of construction um, using real world kind of you know tools um, construction techniques and enables them to to make uh, make that structure over a period of three or four four weeks and um, I, I guess it was it was this and um, and the next project I think which you're going to see on Hannah with Fiona which sort of cemented this idea that that we could um, in um, back home uh, test ways of, of really engaging young people in, in creative and inspired new ways to actively shape their environments. So um, around the same time that Matt was in, um, in the States, seeing young people, children as young as eight, mm. uh, using real tools, real processes, um, I was doing my master's um, in, and my project was based in Japan, and it was very soon after the, the tsunami. And what is that? Is that the camera? Yeah. Wow. I'm sorry working out how to change slides. Um, very tragic, as I'm sure everyone aware, is aware, um, the, the tsunami um, killed one in 10 people in, um, in these fishing villages in the northeast of Japan. And the prefecture were taking a very risk-averse approach to rebuilding following, um, following the tsunami. But many of these fishing communities wanted to move back to where they were. And it was actually children um, who were speaking the truth about the landscape and that it was a landscape that still had meaning to them that they wanted to use um, that held lots of memories and was a place um, where they wanted um, to play and their families to return to. So over a period of, of that year, I worked with um, local architects in Japan and set up an exchange between London and Japan 
where children on both sides were exploring what is home. Um, and this mapping is a mapping that those children in Japan did of this landscape, showing that for them it was still very much a living landscape. Time is very porous. There, um, there are the Yata Yata markets from pre-tsunami. Um, there's the temporary housing from post-tsunami. And for them, it was somewhere which absolutely still had to be used, obviously safely, um, but somewhere really important. And so I got a very visceral experience of how important it is for children to be involved in setting the briefs for the design projects and being involved right at that early stage. So coming out of these two experiences that Matt and I had, and we'd worked together years before this, um, but we, we met up and we reflected on, well, children have so much to offer at the start of the project, at the briefing stage, and they're capable of building. So why are we not involving them at every stage? Um, and so we, we came up with this, um, with this proposal that we, we wanted to undertake a build project where children would be at the heart of every stage from the briefing through the design to building what they, they've designed. Um, and we crowdfunded our first project. Um, we were very fortunate to, we, we put out um, uh, feelers to lots of places, people who had space where we might be able to, to build. Um, and Sutton House got back to us and said, this sounds exciting. Um, we'll, we'll give you the front of, of, uh, of our property. Um, and we'd be interested to see how children could redesign the, the entrance and, and uh, create a performance space at the front of, of Sutton House. Um, so over the course of a week, um, we worked with local schools to work out what the brief for what this performance space should be. Then this is on day one of the week, the, the children designing a space that would make you feel like a borrower. That was the aim. Um, uh, so you'd feel like a small person. Um, and then they built what they had come up with over the course of the following four days using this system of prefabricated elements and these orange nodes um, that enabled them to essentially build and design almost concurrently um, based on on uh, what they liked as they were building it um, and this was a big experiment it was a risk that the, the national trust lent us their insurance uh, which was very very kind of them very welcome and um, but we we essentially hopefully we proved that concept in that week that children can set the brief design a space and, and then build it. And this is on the final day on Friday, on the Friday. Um, and that the space then stayed up for the rest of the summer as a performance space and an entrance to the to Sutton House and a celebration of, of young people's ideas and their imagination. We learned lots from that project, so I'm sure you can you can imagine. But one of the biggest things that stuck with us was getting the right partnership in place at the start and making sure that this project, any project we do is genuinely about the young people and a space that they will go on to have ownership of and be able to continue to inhabit. Um, and we were approached by a very forward thinking um, staff member working for Whole City Culture, Ian Reid, who wanted to through Whole City Culture to um, have an amazing offer, an amazing creative experience for every young person in Hull. And he recognized how different young people are exactly the same way as how different adults are. And there's one school, Oakfield School, which is a school for young people who've been excluded from mainstream education. And the council in a very forward thinking move had given the school um, use of a lot of, uh, of allotment. Um, but as you can see from this picture, it had a very tumble down shed. And so um, Ian's original idea for when he approached us was, could we support the young people at the school to um, build a new shed for their allotment? And we said, um, yep, we're, we're happy to do that. Um, but being true to this, this process that we really believe in, um, first of all, we would like these young people to tell us what it is that they want. It might be a shed, but it might be something more. And um, lo and behold, it was a lot more than just a shed. So um, during a, a series of workshops, they explained to us how they wanted a den, an outdoor classroom, a space which could open up in good weather, close down in, in not so good weather. Um, and these are young people who've never had a space of their own. Um, they're, they're all in this school because they've had um, very challenging and unfair starts in life. Um, and 
this was an opportunity for them to express their ideas and say what it was that they really wanted. So this is one of Connor's designs, which shows um, how he wanted this mechanical roof type structure that could open up in good weather. And he was very insistent that he had the mobile number of our engineer so that he could explain in detail how this had to work, what had to happen. Um, and so uh, as I, um, uh, I mentioned briefly in, a, in another talk we, we did um, for York Design Week, uh, we don't, we never work on the idea of competition. We're always looking for what are the commonalities between the children's ideas so that everybody's voice is heard. So we went through a design process of bringing together their various ideas, presenting their ideas back. And this is what, um, this is what the young people eventually agreed on and had come up with. And it does follow allotment guidelines. Um, it does need to ultimately be um, a shed that's made of timber and is green or brown and technically it fits those requirements so we were very fortunate that we didn't need to get formal planning for this project um, and then came the moment of building it um, and as with all our projects we built it over the course of a week and um, so here are materials arriving on site um, young people being briefed on how to use the tools um, and interestingly, and it's really stuck with us from this project, at the outset, we were told this is a physical restraint school. And because of the nature of using tools, which in some contexts could be dangerous, um, the staff said to us, we'd have no qualms about using physical restraint if we have to, um, to ensure the safety of the students and everyone involved in the project. We're proud to say that never happened. It never needed to happen. And we can't help thinking that that's something about the fact that the young people were being given the opportunity to use real processes, their ideas were being taken seriously. Um, so there was no, they didn't want to mess around. This was something, a space that they were determined to see happen. Um, and therefore that completely changed the dynamic between us and them and even between their, their teachers into us all working together as a team um, over the course of a week. Uh, it was an intensive week, um, this is still on, day one where we've put down foundations, we're building the deck. Um, we were very fortunate to be supported by volunteers, both locally and from the school um, and from uh, uh, students that, that, that we work with. Um, it's all based on uh, fence post foundations and then sand ballast that holds it down. Um, and it was amazing to see over the course of the week how we did all gel into a, a really strong team. Um, and as is the nature with all these projects, there are moments when either Matt or I are crying, normally some point on the Wednesday, um, but then it's the children themselves that keep us going. And this is um, Compo, who's one of the local allotment holders. Um, and of course, it was a project where at the outset, um, there were questions asked around, um, will the children look after the allotment? Uh, what's this gonna mean for the other allotment holders? And you could see the change in their attitude to the young people over the course of this week, seeing the effort that they put in um, to make this really quite extraordinary design that they'd come up with um, a reality in, in five days. Um, the, the, the green is a, a rubber-based waterproof paint, um, which makes it watertight and enabled us to build um, quickly. Um, we did have to work quite late some nights, um, but again, it's the energy that you get from working with young people that makes makes these kind of projects possible. This is on the, the start of the final day when the mayor came to open it. As you can see, the windows are not yet quite in um, and everyone's fairly exhausted, but really, I think, quite um, surprised and happy that, that it's up. Um, these are uh, kind of Connor's opening doors, true to what he wanted in the, the original workshop. Um, and uh, these are some images from, from just as it was being finished. We were fortunate enough um, to, get, to get to go back six months later and see what the children had continued to do. Um, as you can see, they changed the handle. They made it much better than, than what we'd supplied them with. Um, and then they showed um, round uh, the, the team from Coventry and City of Culture to show what they'd done um, and what, what's possible. Um, and here's Compo again, explaining the key part that he played in, in the project. Um, I don't think we've ever had so many potatoes from, <laughs> uh, from somewhere. And um, just briefly to say that project um, also went on to, to win the People's Choice Award in AJ Small Projects, which um, as you can see here, Connor and Dan, they presented the project. Um, I think sometimes there's a, there can be a level of disbelief 
is it really the young people that are designing and building the buildings? Um, and they came, they presented at the crit, and it was 100% clear that it had all come from them. Um, and, and they won that. And these are young people who, um, they, they don't get on to, go on to get their five um, A to C grade GCSEs, but they are no, now both in further education and in employment. Um, and we're still in touch with them. And, and they say that, that this experience really helped them recognize um, the amazing uh, contribution that, that, that they can give um, and how many 16 year olds can say that they've won kind of professional architecture award before they've left, um, left school. Um, I'm, realized I'm probably taking too long, so I'm going to whiz through, whiz through this project. Um, Room for Art was working with a very different age group. So we, we also work with primary school children um, as young as, as seven. Um, and we were approached um, pretty much off the back of the, the whole project by um, Whitechapel Gallery and Lansby Lawrence Primary School to, to, um, uh, to support the school in going through this transition of um, expanding. So the, the original school was built during Festival of Britain um, and has these beautiful interiors designed by um, Peggy Angus who is both an amazing designer, but also an incredible um, artist educator who believed that all young people should have creative opportunity. And um, the, school, the school numbers are going up and this has put pressure on spaces. And naturally it's the subjects that take more space like sport and art and design that can often then fall by the wayside. But there's an amazing teacher at the school, Kerry Sellens, who is determined that the children at the school should be able to um, have the best possible um, uh, education in art and design and so the Whitechapel and the school tasked us with working with year six to um, set the brief for what this new art room should be a community art room design it um, and then go on to build it and this was a chapter project so the build stage was um, to build a, a prototype of part of the art room in the Whitechapel gallery that would go on display for three months um, and then the next chapter would be to actually um, realize the the um, art room itself so in these images, you can see how the children showed us their, their school site, where the, the best place for this art room would be to go. Um, through models, they showed us the type of space that they wanted um, with these oculi that you could climb up into to get away from the sort of the mayhem <laughs> below that they wanted to have. They wanted to be able to do big scale um, projects. And then they developed um, an idea for this sort of scaly skin to the building um, through these three-dimensional tiles, which they first developed through paper forms and then in clay. Um, and uh, they went on display in, in the Whitechapel Gallery. And we were really fortunate that um, Darwin Terracotta, who make tiles for buildings like the Natural History Museum, Eric Parry's designs, um, they heard about the project and said that they would like to make the children's design um, as a formal tile. Um, so that's the Sorry, I've just, this, in this tile, um, slide, you can see the tiles that they went on to make based on the children's um, design, which also went on show in the, in the gallery. And then to culminate chapter one, the children built one part of the art room, one of these oculi in the, um, in the, in the gallery um, over the course of a week. And uh, we try and tailor the systems to take into account the age group of students and um, varying levels of dexterity and just physical size and what it's physically possible to do. Um, and so Matt came up with this series of toggles, which would enable the children to, to build um, the kind of forms that they've been imagining using this lattice structure, but with these elasticated toggles um, that ensure that they could continue to change their design and um, it was malleable while they were building. Um, the children always build on the ground, but we uh, we use pulley systems to enable um, their designs to, to get higher up if necessary. Um, so this is the children seeing their design on display in the Whitechapel Gallery. Many of them have never been to Whitechapel Gallery before, even though they only live a mile down the road. And that's so common across the UK um, in terms of uh, kind of cultural offer and, and the challenge that faces amazing cultural institutions. Um, but through this, all their families came to see their work on display. Um, and then we've carried on taking their design and Matt's practice, MSA, um, uh, have, have continued to, to work through the design in consultation with the children. 
and we're proud to say it's uh, recently got planning permission, um, which both the two together, um, the, the more formal process, but also the work with the young people has really helped as advocacy for enabling fundraising to ensure that this project um, will go on to be built with the children being involved um, in that. Um, and then one more project I'm, I'm going to talk about before handing over to Matt um, is a project that's really special to us. Phoenix School is a school that Matt and I met through Open City um, over 10 years ago and very early on in that we worked um, with an amazing teacher Amanda Benson at Phoenix School. Uh, Phoenix is a school for young people with autism um, many of the, the students there are um, very sensory and nonverbal, and um, I suppose quite sadly the number of young people in, um, in Bow with autism is increasing um, quite dramatically, which means the school needs to move to this new site, this is, was Bow Bo, Bo, Bo Boys School, and the senior management were very concerned that um, particularly for these young people, familiarity with the spaces around them is very important. So they asked if we could work with them in the summer term preceding the move, work with students, every student in the school, to come up with a design for a playground structure that could then be built on this new temporary site um, while they're going through this transition to help as a point of familiarity. So every, uh, every young person, that's 200 young people in the school, were asked to come up with a design for a playground structure um, using uh, on the base of, of triangles. So quite often when we go back to the design process, we think, well, what is possible to build? What materials are available to us? So this was based on the idea of cutting um, a, a two by four sheet of ply on the diagonal and then having two triangles um, and that being the sort of module that we could then work with to create the design and from this these amazing designs that children have come up with we worked with a smaller group of 15 students um, who curated and pulled out their favorite aspects from all of the designs um, created in the school and then um, with us created what we we call the paper build which is often kind of half scale where we test out ideas um, so that the children get more of a physical experience of, of what the space looks and feels like and continue to design and change it. Um, and so this was their paper build. Um, and these forms that came about, the diamonds, the fox ears that, that came up, um, we then worked through back in, in the office. This was a project that we needed to get planning permission for because of its scale and where it was being situated. Um, and, and then we also worked through systems of how can the young people themselves build and this this project of course um we we needed to treat in a in a very special way because these young people are um many of them are non-verbal and highly sensory um but in that way actually the project can have even more meaning to it um we were very lucky with the weather it was probably about this time three years ago that we were building so i don't know why the sky looks so blue it's, it's, <laughs> it's not blue now sadly um but this was a week a week-long build um, again, using timber, um, using ply uh, sheet, um, and the young people, again, being involved at every stage. Um, in the wider group of young people from the whole school were invited to make um, little tokens that attached like tiny tiles um, to the whole structure. Um, and so again, this went up um, in the course of a week in the, in the playground. Um, and uh, this is at the, at the end of that that week. The hand um, to Matt. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Take a quick sip if I should have done that earlier. Um, so not all the projects we work on are, are as big as that. So I'm gonna to touch on a couple of smaller projects and then are currently our largest, our largest build to date. Um, we, um, we've worked, tend to work with a lot of creative organizations and often the organizations and galleries as Fee's touched on with Whitechapel who are delivering a lot of the outreach and uh, creative curriculum that would have normally been part of um, uh, schools but has been cut in recent years. So this was a really lovely project um, as a pilot um, in year one to work with all of the year seven uh, students in the, uh, in the, in the and Borough of Thanet um, 
and that was um, really to allow them to have an opportunity to work with the gallery to get the philosopher in residence at the gallery to talk about those challenges of, of going from being the biggest fish in the pond uh, at primary school to that kind of rather isolating kind of often isolating kind of condition of being uh, arriving in year seven and um, that was done through um, a day with each school child from year seven in the in, in the in the borough and um and and coming coming to look at artwork but also to make um an installation which was an additive installation which really asked every child to work in work as a partnership with 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 someone from another school to talk about their experiences and to make a simply quite simply make a viewfinder that made a connection with the landscape outside and that grew over time so um the first set of children that made those 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 viewfinders were dealing quite simply with the with the natural environment but over time as that, that as this as this structure started to grow up, there was a mediation and a negotiation between other people's work and the conversation that had to wider conversation that had to emerge. And this was then the pilot for the the subsequent year, where 1,500 um, young people during the Turner year got involved in in another additive project. Um, and that's a sort of super exciting way of us, I guess, engaging on on a more sort of um, immediate way with with young people. Or it might be this project last summer with um, Lakeland Arts. Um, to work with young carers um, in their in their time once once a month outside of their, their um, often kind of very full um, home environments where they're where they're supporting other members of their families an opportunity to to do something for themselves and this was again um, fee touch on this the su success of our projects is about building really trusted relationships with with um, our collaborative partners right from from the word go and with the young people we're working with but this was actually another project through the collaboration with Ian Reid who moved on from the City of Culture to, um, to Lakeland Arts. And this was an opportunity to give young people a, um, a, 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 an opportunity to make a structure within a gallery context with world-class kind of pieces of artwork. And it was their interpretation. It was the, the, the gallery through their eyes. And each person made a, a, an element which was a sort of beautifully made um, um, braised brass viewfinder you see here looking at a particular part of the room um, and, and, a, and a way in which you, they wanted you to see it. So a series of seats and viewfinders in different configurations. And again, that then with an interpretive kind of signage was, was on display for, for four months and allowed other people to see the world um, quite through through quite unique way, um, but from from people who are often maybe isolated from from that conversation and within the context of a gallery, which in this 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 area at least was predominantly adults visited by adults. And again, this idea of of placing and considering crafts, so giving young people the skill to make things that are that that are exquisitely made or and and are considered beforehand, so they can be made well and finished well and sit. Um, equally um, uh, to, to, to finish pieces of work in gallery context. And then I, I'm going to do it a little bit more on, on this. I mean, with, with sort of, I think half an hour. So we, we, I spent about sort of 10, 15 minutes talking about this project, which um, to date um, is our largest constructed, but is, is, is now um, uh, growing into bigger and even more uh, kind of amazing projects. But this one, uh, we want to take a little bit of time of talking through because it sort of sets the processes um, which we've covered in, in some of those other ones, but in a, in a, in a, in a, in a more um, stage way, so you can see that. So um, uh, two years ago, um, we were given an opportunity to move into this amazing disused meanwhile space, which was a fire station, well, actually not fire station, it was where the fire engines for London, Great London were fixed. Um, and we, were, we, we had a studio just in, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the, the, just up here on this mezzanine level, along with a lot of other sort of creative uh, makers and uh, uh, cultural organizations. One which was the Institute of Imagination, who I guess um, is an organization motivated by, in the same way that we are by involving young people in sort of construction and making theirs is to, um, uh, to allow young people to flex their imagination in, in really creative ways by skilling them and giving them the skills to work in, in I guess, across the arts and STEM um, subjects in a way that they can they can be empowered too, and they they like us were only temporarily in this building. And in in thinking about um, uh, their new home, which which they were um, which they're conceiving of and raising funds for, they wanted to test bed that um, that thinking with with a group of young people. Um, they had this idea of the Mega Maker Lab, which was a, a very large space that that would be curated by them to allow 
um, people from London and further afield to, to come and spend time in to tinker and make and test and explore. And they had some really clear ideas about what they wanted, but they wanted to open that up to a, uh, a, a young person's led, I guess, I guess folk um, process of, 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 of thinking about that. And we developed that, I guess Fees touched on this. We often work with large groups of people, but then a sort of a core, smaller cohort of, of younger people that help drive a project through. In this case, it was actually about working with lots of local schools and we, we engage with them over a series of days, series of workshops um, where, young, where a whole uh, group of uh, schools um, from between, uh, I guess, the last two years of primary were involved in, in that process about thinking about the their space in, in different ways, making models to test that out um, and to think more laterally about how this space could be used. And that's first of all about taking control of that space, thinking physically about your ownership of it. And then through a series of prescribed, I guess, workshops, which looked at the top um, main right-hand image with feet pointing to the center, the territorial aspects of that space, how you think about making that and dividing that, and then um, how you make sense of a very large volume, how you start to curate that. And we, we, we tested those, and each of these are made with, with groups of young people. So thinking about the territory, the sense of enclosure that you form there. So these are all models from the young people through those workshops whether that's an expansive enclosure, whether that's a cozy enclosure. And then we asked, invited young people to tell us stories about that. Sometimes it's not just about the, the physical attributes of a, of a space, but it's the, the narrative of the stories, the thing that might be driving that, that design. And we use, often use this method of, of what we sort of call heat analysis, where you, where you explore a whole series of these, um, uh, maybe 50 or so models, and you start to see the patterns that, that emerge the common common patterns and that's not that's not designing by committee but that's seeing the sort of strands that evolve out of that so a series of of uh if you like patterns emerge with a sort of central space and i guess this this was the thing that challenged um the curatorial idea that the that the original client that an institute imagination had which was about a series of a linear routes through uh, a series of um, processes and activities for the young for the young people they very much saw this as an opportunity for them to, around the central space, have a whole series of destination maker and testing spaces, which they could cross fertilize ideas. And that completely shook the brief up on its head and came very directly out of those workshops. And again, testing and analyzing those structures. And that starts to set out this sort of, I guess, a series of constraints to which we're working to a brief, if you like, that's been set by those young people that we're testing against um, a set of protocol. And what, <coughs> became very clear was that we needed ways in which we could take over that space. This was something that was going to be built over a week. We're talking about something that's about two or three sides, the size of sort of five side football pitches um, over, I think, 70 meters long and uh, 20 meters wide. So we're looking at really big, really big, really big space. And so we looked at this idea of territories, of, of configuring a series of components that had that shared forms that were three or four different shapes that you could use to reconfigure that. We wanted to take ownership of the aerial, the aerial nature of the space, the bigness of the space to create, um, uh, I guess, a ceiling or a, a, a volume that could be shifted or they wanted that they could be shifted and transform and turn from cozy environments to expansive environments. And we dedicated those to three, three particular spaces. One was a, an enclosure to form more intimate, acoustically controlled environment. One was a, an additive structure and one was something that would be adapted on a day-to-day -day basis. And so as we're, this is a process in which we're developing a system, the young people we very much um, say are designing the, the space and the, the idea. And we're there, I guess, as, in some ways as kind of curators or to, to help facilitate that or facilitators to help this, this, process, this process happen. Um, for those projects to happen in a short period of time, a lot of sort of logistics, and we again say that we don't really design the spaces, we design the sort of processes. So we had established how we wanted to do that. We, we, we work through kind of um, computer modeling to test those things out. It's a really important um, aspect of what we do with young people that, that, that um, we, that their, that their expectations are managed right from the, from the word go and that, that the ambition of those isn't crushed, but that we know we can deliver what we start out to do. And, and touch wood to date, we've, we've, we've never not make, met a deadline. But that's, that requires a lot of thinking, um, a lot of testing. We're working with an extended group of um, where our projects are funded through, through, um, 
through our, our collaborative um, partners, but um, industry champions, engineers, architects um, help fund the initiative as well and give their time. This was an engineering session part the way through, testing ideas always, as Fee said, often through first principles. And it's not just um, us, but also engineers that work with us often really enjoy this process when a lot of people are, well, even more so these days, are, are tied at home or in offices um, and actually this opportunity to get out and test things. But playing with these, these ideas backwards and forwards, um, there's periods where our office becomes workshop, but there's a, there's a balance always between this is the month leading up to a build. So behind the scenes, as, as the young people have developed those ideas, they're, they're really being tested technically. But then at, at moments, still needing to really involve those young people, both in the collaborative process of making. This case, we're, we're developing and refining the, the one of the central spaces that you'll see later. This was a group of um, uh, young people from a partner school with one of the primary schools coming in um, as part of their DT module to work with the technical, technical with our engineers to, to, to develop that. And so these processes are ongoing and involving um, people. And it's, and it's often the conversations in both the bills and these making that are collaborative. And then, le then leading, I'm rapidly racing up now because I'm wanting to wrap up. Then in the last week, it's all about logistics. This is Aggie, I think, <laughs> la the last tumble before, um, before getting in. And, and then, then the bills happens. The, the materials arrive. There's preparation before the young people come. Uh, we're blessed by uh, a huge um, support from all the volunteers. So that our core team are, are, are paid um, the, the living wage and, and work, work um, for us in a paid capacity. But we have, we're blessed and the projects are made possible and amplified their ambition by volunteers who come. And we do very thorough briefing exercises with them, both in uh, welfare, safety, we're working with young people, but in the processes they're going to be made over a series of evenings before those 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 builds. So again, everything is working smoothing. Setting up the site for the kids early in the week. This is setting up as a, a fee touched on. We're working a lot with um, uh, elevated structures, suspended structures, um, testing those. Engineers coming in, checking those things. So really, getting I guess in some ways getting the groundwork in. So when that first morning before the, the calm before the storm, um, when all the magic starts to happen, and those people who um, are have come back um, and are able to bring their, their vision to life in, in a day and are using tools and are building the things that they remember making as models. Um, and again, it's these moments we, we're blessed with, with large numbers of volunteers. In this case, we work with, um, I think, 50 young people, uh, 10 each day, cycling through, all of them getting opportunities to work on every jingle, single, every jingle, every single part of um, those processes. And again, finding space and time to work in, in kind of quite controlled ways where every young person has a, a, an adult volunteer um, working with them. So those experiences are really um, um, particular and times given where it's needed. And you see this, at, at, this is day three, I think. Um, some of the more uh, uh, older members of the, um, of the young people helping out. Um, uh, day one, I think this is, or day two, seeing things start to emerge. And this is, this is the, all of the components, the aerial structure starting to come up. The first glimpse of that structure you saw on the table emerging. And then this is a roof which reconfigures and reshapes on a daily basis for making the space more intimate, larger, smaller. And then uh, children putting the felt together for this quilted space, this acoustic central space. Um, I'm going to just keep flicking through these because they sort of the stories told by them. Aggie and Harry, the two project managers in that case, I think it's the end of day four. I think this is one of the cry, my crying moments, I think probably up top there, but, but also recollecting that we were, we were almost there, but still a lot to do on that, that final day. Um, I think this was in the morning, we had to do some spraying stuff without the young people there. Um, and then this is, yeah, final day, gathering stuff together, um, putting the little final finishing touches on. And that sort of magic moment, I think we lifted up the lantern going inside in this beautifully kind of enclosed acoustic space. Um, and then that's the volunteers for, for the last day of build. And it's, it's thanks to those guys that make those things possible, the tools. And then I guess the, the final thing, un, unused, but that's not what it's about. Um, it's um, about this transformation. And over that month, we had 10,000 people come and visit that space and adapt it and change it and grow it. Um, 
and it's now become the blueprint for the Institute of Imagination's new headquarters that they that they will um, be seeking to build over the next five years as they as they fundraise and realise that in in the London docks. So super excited to be part of that. It's now dismantled um, in storage, ready to be reappropriated in their next meanwhile home. This is Yip and Amy, and I'm going to just flick really last last three or four slides. This was a project which is very dear to us and is, is live, but we were due to build this a week after we went into lockdown um, and um, is a performance space for, for Oval House Theatre um, who were moving um, from one part of London to another. And this engaged with a group of young people um, identified um, with uh, challenges of isolation, either in their home or work and school lives. Um, and working with them collaboratively to make a space which would be representative of them um, as, as the custodians of, of the new theatre and performance space in Brixton. And we took them um, to see world classes of Wayne McGregor's studio, um, taking these young people often out of, out of the everyday to see things completely new. They might be just on their doorstep, but they might not have that opportunity. Or to see the robotics department at UCL and to see how the architecture of the 21st century might be might be conceived and made and then this final this tangibility of making models is is absolutely critical to that process and um the young people had developed an incredible structure we were being filmed at the time um by george clark's amazing spaces which was good fun uh, if not challenging you, you realize that the film people really want to take control of how you you do things and, and that the children were having none of that so it was a kind of a confused day but um this is their half half scale. Actually, this is a video. This is this is one of the guys dancing in, as he as he directed the four sides of this element. And we created this incredible structure, um, which is a series of four pavilions, which was um, which will sit underneath. Um, these are quarter scale, so um, we it was due to be our biggest build yet. We had uh, sixty volunteers booked in, and we will complete that um, this coming summer. So um, uh, in a world where we can re um socially not this what's the opposite distance uh re-engage <laughs> socially come together um uh we look forward to that but um yeah i guess it's been it's been a super we we let we entitled the lecture sort of rebuild uh, i guess the, the the last few months have been challenging for so many people but in a curious way we hadn't stopped um and this this stopped some of our projects but they will they will go on and but it's given us time to reflect and and actually 2021 and 22 are super exciting years where I think this is this this more than ever is, is needed. Um, this kind of work is um, where young people are given opportunities to, to engage in their worlds and their education, where they can work outside, where they can work collaboratively, where they can learn through making is, is as important as ever. So we're super excited um, and we're looking forward to, to rebuild. And uh, thank, thanks very much. And thank you, Rebecca, for <laughs> inviting us today. And and the reason that we yes. we were we've been asked to to speak is um, that Rebecca reached out to us. I think maybe first time was it a year ago, Rebecca? And then at some point in the early stages of lockdown, I, I remember getting a text from you that sort of sounded like <laughs> finally realised what what it is that you guys do. Um, and so we we've hopefully got some exciting so it looks like yeah it looks like we're yeah york york bound in the next few months anyway Hopefully. Which is super I don't so. start talking about it properly <laughs> and like, no, 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 no. We'll keep, keep it cryptic <laughs> yeah um thank you so much that was so fun i just love it i was just sat smiling the whole time i feel like um as well these these um digital sessions we don't do clapping and i think that's what's missing from i'm just i just want to clap <laughs> remember when you said to clap well, james. <laughs> um amazing shall i open the floor if anyone wants to ask any questions or comment or say anything um Please feel free to <laughs> Frank's clapping on the on the chat. <laughs> clapping. Um, yeah, did anyone want to ask any questions? Feel free to drop questions into the chat and I can read them out if you prefer not to speak or if you want to um, turn your video on and, and and unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, 
Can I? Bonnie? Yeah. Um, I used to work with young people in a sort of residential setting in that I would go and live with them for two or three days a week um, on, a, on a rotor with other members of staff. So there would be two two members of staff to one young person and physical restraints were quite a large part of of uh, our daily routine with them, unfortunately. Um, and there wasn't much scope for sort of creative classes in terms of um, grand scale um, sort of projects, really. That You know, there was a bit of soapstone carving or we'd have some sort of 3D uh, chicken wire sort of sculpture days. And I just wondered, how, how have you found engaging with other people sort of parties to get the money to be able to realise, you know, these sort of, well, these quite sort of amazing things that you've done. Is it Has it been quite a battle to get people to see the value in that for young people? I, I think, I think um, hopefully people see uh, the, our project speak for themselves. And so now we've got a few under our belt. It's very tangible. And actually that process of convincing people of the value of that is is often self-explanatory, even just through the pictures and anecdotes. We try and find methods of, of more analytically recording that. But I think it's worth, John, it's just it's really interesting you're raising that because um, this project was seeded from a relationship between Ian, who was uh, head of learning as part of the City of Culture, but not the school. It was actually, it was within the, um, it was in the, within the social care department uh, wing of that kind of that organization. Right. So like the, the, the social care uh, aspect, which was, it sounds like you might have been in quite a similar situation where they were looking after the young people outside of their curriculum time was the relationship that was where, where the project was seeded. It was, the, it was the ambition of someone like yourself and, and, this, and this person within the city of culture that, that drove the project. And um, it wasn't that the school wasn't grateful for that and committed to it, but they didn't drive that process. They only, um, and so it was actually a very small cohort of young people that we worked with originally, six or seven young people actually within one of the residential houses. And that only became that thing that the rest of the school was so much more interested in as the project was realized. And then more and more that, 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 that came to, to be. So um, yeah, I don't know if you want to add on in terms of the processes. And, and yeah, I mean, are you, are you also sort of um, alluding to funding and how, how do you get people who've got the money to make a project like that happen to put that yeah. money on the table? Um, so I, I wish that we knew the kind of magic answer to that. I, th I think um, we we have been fortunate in a lot of projects have come about through word of mouth and they haven't all had, at the point that people have approached us, they haven't all had the full amount of funding on the table. That's where we've, we've started developing this chaptering process whereby if a school is able to crowdfund a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds, we will do as much as is possible with that and then off the back of that use that as advocacy to get bigger right. grants. Okay. N nearly always, I mean all of the projects I would say we're working with what could be deemed a hard to reach audience in some aspect, whether it's either the majority of young people are on free school meals or they're young carers and they've been excluded from mainstream school. And actually that can be it can be easier to fund a project in that realm than it is for um, a I suppose a more mainstream school because there are trusts and foundations that have very specific remits to um, to uh, improve the life chances for those young people. So for example, um, the family maker space that Matt showed that was funded by the Colt Foundation and one of their remits is to um, to try and prevent young people from suffering loneliness and ensure that they feel engaged with um, with their peers and with the, the wider world. So um, in actual fact, and, and again, we sort of see it often with SEND schools, that there they have more control over their budget than mainstream schools. So the challenge can sometimes be how to, how to do these projects um, more, more widely. And that's something that we're kind of, we're constantly looking at. But I think it is now the kind of responsibility also lies with us to have that thorough evaluation so that we can present that theory of change to um, to various funders alongside obviously the hopefully the kind of the wow factor of this is a building that's been designed and built by by children which we hope speaks volumes in itself 
but we know that these projects offer so much more than just the space in terms of that experience for, for absolutely the, for the yeah. yeah okay well thank you very much for that thank you um james you wanted to ask a question before you head off because you've got an event that you're hosting in half and 40 minutes so yeah thanks sorry to jump the queue um hi matt and Fiona. that's really amazing like just yeah i mean i said last night i was introduced to to the you know to what you do last night and was just like you know this is amazing and um yeah really blown away so um it and I, it's not really a fully formed thought i guess really but it, it's just maybe some reflection as you know both of you have been involved in architecture education but when i left sort of over 10 years ago um i was sort of taken back by the fact that um you know, architecture students weren't really encouraged to go on site and to work um, with contractors or to really understand what it was to build the buildings that they were designing. And that's just why I think this is just superb because it just goes one step further. Because, you know, for me working in the industry, there's this huge um, friction between architects and builders sometimes because um, they don't really understand, architects don't understand where builders are coming from and vice versa. And I think this is a, is a step on from that. So I don't know if, if um, if architecture education has moved on since then, but when we're thinking about the context of climate change and and, and the things we need to embed in our culture to change, I just I, I wondered whether um, you know you'd noticed in terms of the things that the kids are talking about when they're you know are they thinking about climate change? Is that something that's in their mind? Are they you know what kind of discussions and ideas are coming from you know apart from the amazing looking buildings that they're creating? Is there other more um, context in terms of the the social issues that we're we're facing? I think I think there's definitely there definitely is, and and some of those those conversations were were widely had probably in the Mega Maker Lab and some of those other projects. Um, the, most of the projects that we built are, are are fairly low carbon in in their own in their own right, and that we we make the young people aware of the impact of materials and things that we're that we're using and understanding that. Um, I guess as as the buildings and the ambition of the projects are, are becoming bigger, that's an even more important part of that that discussion. So. I would say they're supremely aware of that wider conversation, and it's definitely part of the conversation that we're having now with them in terms of um, that that brief. And I think one of the things is that for young people, often, um, well, as I think just generally as teachers, one of the biggest challenges for failures in education is when you under undervalue the kind of ability for young people to make decisions and and the responsibility that they can be given. Um, and actually, if you if you tell a, a group of young people that they have I don't know, 10,000 pounds to spend on a structure and you show them six 10,000 pound structures and you ask them what they want to build. They won't do things on sky hooks. They won't do the floating jet swimming pools. You know, they'll, they're really, people, young people, you know, given the right um, ingredients are really, really um, pragmatic and intelligent thinkers and are really cognizant of that. More widely, I think this kind of conversation about architectural education, I think it, it's very polarized and it depends where you go to where and when when you went to school I would say it, it's changing I think that that the conversation about the, the environment is, is definitely changing but this nature of, of the schism between um, the the conceiver of an arch, of architecture and the maker of architecture the builders and, the, and the, the architect is still pretty much embedded in our culture and I would say that's that's one of the reasons why I think so many of our volunteers um, uh, um, from both the engineering and the architecture profession love being involved in those projects because it gives them that opportunity to to get stuck in and to bridge those things that they that they didn't necessarily have now there are certainly schools that do that really well but they they also don't talk so much about the working with contractors so a lot of schools are, are current doing things like I said I mean a lot of the processes are seeded in uh, the teaching methods I've used with young architects in their early stage of their profession I guess education but the the process is now some of the most rewarding things are the moments when you know I showed you that big bit uh, when the moment the bloke comes to drop off the um you know the plywood and sees you know two women in you know who you know are there on a building site and that's that's a revelation for them for that person it's not a revelation for us it's completely normal to have a uh, a, a gender mixed, you know, um, and racially mixed kind of work environment, completely normal for, for us. But it, it, it's a reflection for those other people who are peripheral to that and come into that process. Um, whether we were building in um, the Whitechapel Gallery, working with some of those people who often are sidelined in that context where they would just be the technicians or the, you know, and actually they're brought on board in that process and are 
given a kind of creative voice with those young people. And so I think all of our projects have had moments where, where, that's, where those things are much more overlaid. And I would say, hopefully, um, yeah, there are lessons being learned. And I, and I guess there's, there's an interest in what we're doing um, which is growing and that grows not outside of our sector, it's growing into and influencing, you know, all sorts of um, other elements of the profession. So I don't know, rambling answer, I'm not sure if I quite answered it, but sorry. No, that was great. It was a rambling question. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really sorry, I would love to stay and uh, I'm glad it's been recorded so I'll catch the end button. Um, yeah. Thank you, really inspiring, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so Rima, I wanted to ask a question as well. Um, oh my, Rima's a new student of mine. There you go, trouble. <laughs> I, 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 Hi, Matt. I haven't. And Fiona. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you. This has been a very, very inspiring talk, and I've been smiling through the whole talk. It's very exciting. Um, it's really, it's really nice to see that there are programs in society that are encouraging children to be more creative and unleash their creativity, because a lot of, um, like many children, are encouraged to kind of reach an end result rather than kind of develop their ideas or like, like, be creative. And even especially with toy design now, um, there are my, like a lot of toys that don't encourage children to be creative but more relate to the media and certain characters so it's it's really nice and super lovely to be familiar with such projects that encourage children to be more creative so yeah thank you thank you Rima that's really really kind um, and we would agree with you that I think alongside encouraging young people to use their imaginations is also we're very aware we're working in a context where children as young as four are being tested continually and that there's very much a kind of one size fits all, all mold that young people are being told this is what you need to aspire mm -hmm. to this is what you need to get and it's uh, creating such a monoculture and actually if anything this year can teach us um, an education system doesn't work like that when you're presented with an unprecedented challenge like a pandemic um, on this scale and how do you respond to that and we need people who are creative thinkers and yet our education system isn't encouraging that. I think the, yeah the open the, comes, the, 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 the idea of the open-ended question which you touched on is, is, is often is not how we teach and um, it's, it's sometimes I mean our processes are um, and our projects, when we when we work with a cultural partner, we we have we say to them, like you you define the outline of what that brief might be. So in the case of um, Phoenix, it might be a, a, a structure in the playground that could act as a shelter or a destination. But beyond that, we say that the question is open ended, and that providing it gets delivered within the budget and on time and safely, um, you've got to be open to where that that might take you. And I guess. That open-ended question um, breeds the most kind of creative thinking, and that's that's really where we should embed that in so much more of our education. Fees right, and you're right, than 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 um, grade-based attainment or kind of you know working to to to, to a, a fixed result. Being attacked by a fly. And Thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've got a few more questions in the um, chat box. We are over time, but if, if you're happy to stay on for oh, a no, sorry. Guys. No, we can stay on for Yeah. <laughs> um, so, ah, um, so um, Simeon says, that, thank you for the talk, it's fantastic. Um, love the methodology and the logic behind the project. Um, you're doing an amazing tra trailblazing a model of architecture practice that needs to become more and more prominent across the country. How much evaluation of the children's learning growth happens afterwards, say half a year or two a year? So this seems to be key in many of the projects. Hi, Simeon. Um, nice that you've joined us. And again, I know that you're doing lots of um, really interesting work. Um, and we've collaborated in the past, which has been brilliant. Um, it's, a really, it's a really good point. So um, Matt and I, we're not academics. So we don't work in that kind of, I suppose, formal sense of um, evaluating projects on the long term. At the moment, a lot of our evaluation is much more anecdotal. So we're very fortunate. I think what 
what we have been fortunate with and hopefully do quite well um, is make friends with the people that we work with. And so most of these collaborators have become really long standing friends who we keep in touch with. And through that network and that relationship, we hear about what happens to those young people and what they go on to do. So that's how we know what the young people who are involved in the whole project are now doing. Um, is through Steve, who's one of the carers at the school, and through Ian, um, and through keeping regular contact with them. And actually, now that those young people are over 18, they've reached out to us directly um, to let us know what they're, they're up to. So that's been, that's been amazing. Um, I think there is a huge amount more that we could do on an academic perspective. And um, a lot of this, and a lot of the reflections we've been having this year during COVID and developing our business plan have been how can we partner with other organizations who have these these skill sets which we don't have necessarily in-house we're kind of we're quite a small and nimble organization and that has lots of advantages for us in many ways of what we're able to do um, but it also means that we don't necessarily have um, maybe that sort of academic evaluation but it's something that as I was saying um, earlier to Johnny is really useful to have for funding applications um, because uh, we're very fortunate if someone comes to a building site and sees the projects happening, there are no questions around what's the value. Um, but unfortunately, too often, the way funding is applied for, you have to translate that value um, into a spreadsheet. And so we've done various courses with people like the New Economics Foundation of how do you take, what, what, how do you take the value of this for one young person and equate that financially? Um, and these things are always slightly abstract. But unfortunately, we live in a world which is a little bit abstract. And so if you can do that, it's, it's really helpful. I don't know if that answers you. I imagine, Simeon, you're going to be coming up with some, some um, much more uh, eloquent ways <laughs> to, to evaluate. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. She says, love it, it did. <laughs> um, so I think Emma Berman wanted to ask a question as well. Verbally, am I there? I see you. Uh, yeah, I couldn't unmute there. Um, so I'm, I'm also, I also think with a massive great grin all the way through that. I work a lot with young people and shipping containers and play and going into communities. And um, what we've never really done is kind of an end, end process. It's kind of like lots of loose parts play or creative imagination and quite a lot around what would make this place better for you, but not sort of followed through to the point of actually um, materialising something more permanent, quite often in disadvantaged areas as well. So um, I suppose we've used shipping containers a lot because we realise matches in some of that early trust building might be a, an issue as well. But I suppose other than cloning you and your business model kind of requiring you to be in every place everywhere, what, what's your kind of dream really? If you could kind of see the world as you wanted it to be what can we all take away from today's talk about you know you losing business what what do you want us to go off and do that's my question to you well i think that's a, it's a really good question and we can sort of test some of our thinking uh, that's been evolving in the last kind of few months so i think speaking with um we've, we've been listening to a lot of we've been talking ourselves and thinking about that quite detailedly but we've also been trying to listen and hear with open ears to the people we've worked with, and that's the young people, our cultural collaborators, and then volunteers. And I think one thing, you're, you're spot on. Um, we don't want to grow the organization, but in the sense that um, we always see there being a series of builds, but those builds becoming more ambitious and being, if you like, they are, they are, the, um, they are the ambassadors, um, even more so probably than, than we are. It's the, it's the outcomes of those projects, the, the, and the, the, the visual manifestation of that and the young people doing it that uh, have convinced time on time on time on project and project and project over the last four years of the, of the, of the value and the worth in, in that. Um, what we realize though, is that there's, there's probably for every project that we're able to achieve, there are 10 or 20 that we can't. And that's for a whole number of reasons. One, one you can spot on, we can't clone ourselves quite yet. Um, 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 and but we we do want to find mechanisms of sharing that and we're aware that there's a much there's a broader resource of skills that we have which we're quite happy to, to share and with other people and we, we in the next kind of 12 months I think you'll see ways in which 
um, our processes, workshops, methodologies, and, and, and programs will be shared as a series of kind of um, how-to kind of instruction things that schools and, and other groups and organizations can use in the sort of free source way. We also see the value in, in um, there being funding and money to train people on a bigger sort of basis and, and to give people an opportunity, maybe like ourselves or like other young volunteers to, to come and, and be active, kind of um, lead, share those skills in a more kind of qualified way. And that's tying sort of to some of the things Fee's saying about um, finding the right um, partners potentially to, to um, develop some form of accreditation where what we do could be a could be some form of qualification that would allow and enable those young people young people people to do that and to experience that um and i think why but more widely i think we also see there being room if we had a um um a, a series of spaces um nationally you know wouldn't need to be very many that we could offer um, our pro projects are predicated on young people um, doing, um, meeting us with us and, our, and the people we're working with over a period of time in a series of discrete workshops and then this build. But actually, if we have space, there's opportunity for um, certain young people who we, we never manifested what we do as being about training young architects or engineers or construction professionals. But there are a small cohort of people that would like like to do that and would like to do that in a new and innovative kind of way and so we see with the right again with the right partner and this is all about finding those right partners and sharing um, there are opportunities to, to set up appropriate let's call them apprenticeships where young people could work in a place over a period of time to develop a build over six months for example um, you know um, and I don't I mean there are yeah, I mean, I think lots of the conversations that we're having with various partners are about finding ways in which young people might get um, those smaller cohort of young people might get a, uh, a longer involvement with with what we do. Um, and then I guess there's, you know, when we set this up, it was just two people that wanted to do a holiday club. And we, we, we're not political. Uh, uh, when we didn't start off with a sort of political agenda here. But um, yeah, a, a large part of what we do is advocate and 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 evangelize i guess in some sort of way about what we do so um providing we can do that in a way where we can you know um keep a roof over our heads and in a not-for-profit way you know share that and share our time and resource we want to, that to be as wide as possible the biggest ambition would be to, to be to try and shape and influence i guess our our national curriculum and how we think about um this um free and then we want to talk more about it he's done research and, and spent time in finland where the architecture is on the national curriculum um, and as a way of thinking about the world architecture is a very broad education for anyone who's studied it at an undergraduate level it's about you know as much about people as it is about place and um yeah if you want to elaborate yeah just um, briefly i could add that it's a kind of conversation that rebecca and i were having last night as well around um how can how can you provide these um or what skills would you provide to children more broadly? And actually we were sort of concluding that it's around the sort of confident curiosity, which sounds very much like the kind of work that you're already doing with young people of um, giving them validity and value to their ideas and, um, and giving them the confidence to feel able to ask the questions so they can find out the answer because you could, you could approach any architect in the country and, and they wouldn't be able to tell you everything about every way of building. We all become specialists in certain areas. So it's it's really giving young people the skills to know how they can find out what information they want and hopefully then become you know, informed citizens who, who are really active um, in shaping the places where they live, work and play, whether that's professionally within the system or whether that's, that's just within them being active, engaged human beings. Um, so we have a few ideas in the pipeline, but we'd also be really keen to hear from people about how we could actively yeah. help and support. Um, and as Matt's mentioned, a few of those things, whether it's certain free source um, ideas that we can provide, whether it's um, one off training sessions that we could do, whether it's inviting more people to when we do do a build to sort of to see how that happens. Um, but yes, we, we have a few ideas in the pipeline, which we'll hope to be able to make more public over the coming months. But we'll always love to hear more ways that we can, we can help. 
Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, guys. I think we'll probably have to wrap up because everyone's like, kind of, we could just sit here and talk forever, I think, <laughs> very easily. <laughs> um, so thank you so, so much. And um, I want to do a round of applause, whether whether people want to join yeah. or not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, and yeah, if anyone wants to head to Matt and Fiona's website, it's mattandfiona.org. Um, and yeah. Yeah, look out for things that are happening in York soon. Hopefully, yeah, well, watch this space. Watch this space. I, I, I it's, it's gonna, it's gonna happen. Uh, gonna no happen. doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> they will come. <laughs> cool. Thank Thanks so you. much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.